in a studio somewhere far, far away. for me in my car is the wave you know the one that you have to do when someone lets you through or does you any sort of driving favor you know? <laughs> sometimes I'm concentrating so hard on doing the wave that I crash <laughs> into the person I was trying to wave at. I really need that wave in a big depressed city or cross town it's the nearest you get to a hug all week and it's a deep 20th century need in a big depressed city or cross town the in-car wave can do wonders for a man's popularity <laughs> Oh, well, it's kind of a stupid move when you think about it. It's like, yeah, thanks for letting me through this two-inch gap. To show my appreciation, I'm going to take it looking at you, smiling, and with one hand off the steering wheel. <laughs> one thing, though, that definitely eases the crosstown tension is those people who earn money by wiping your windscreen at traffic lights. What a fantastic business idea that is. Ruined for me only by the fact that on my car, I happen to have something called a windscreen wiper. <laughs> you know, like, this is a job that my car does by itself. It's like, thanks, yeah, no, I don't need it. And at night, I also don't need someone to lie on the bonnet holding a torch. <laughs> well, I can't stand there and act as a brake. Yeah, that's fine. Who done as it may this month, some 10,000 motorists and pedestrians will be injured in road traffic accidents. The majority through the most elementary errors. <laughs> The car I once had, a Toyota Corolla, was, between the months of January and April 1989, used by the local tramps as a knocking shop right? <laughs> and general house, right? So many tramps did this that I started to think, has it been recommended somewhere? <laughs> With me, yes. Well, I'm world! Of all cars parked in the North West London area, David Bedeal's Toyota Corolla is perhaps the perfect performer for the damaged like itinerant dropout from society. Once inside, this ashtray doubles as a toilet, whilst with the system of vomiting, this armrest will eventually soften to form a nice pillow. <laughs> Just about it from Top Gear. Next week, we'll be asking if you shut on the back seats. Does that mark it as, as your territory? <laughs> Goodbye. Possibly the most dismal type of party is the barbecue. These are popular in Australia, where a burnt lump of half-frozen chicken constitutes oat cuisine. The basic problem with barbecues is they don't cook food. <laughs> but you have to find a socially acceptable way of saying this. I think this could just do with another couple of minutes. But even worse can be those family get-togethers. The annual Christmas party can be worst of all, especially for children. Seeing adults act like children. If assuming the Christmas get-together is hideous, it is but nothing compared to the annual trial afterwards of writing the thank you letters. The day after Boxing Day, your parents would manacle you to the Basildon bomb, and you wouldn't be allowed up again until you'd written to thank Granny for the record token. Now, the problem with this was that Granny, like all older relatives, had a concept of the value of money 
that was permanently 20 years out of date. <laughs> there you'd be, writing a thank you letter that went, Dear Granny, thank you for the record token. I look forward to spending it. Love you. When what you really wanted to be writing was, Dear Granny, please try and understand the concept of inflation. <laughs> this won't even buy me a single. Still, never mind, I've cashed it in and I'm using it as down payment on a Mars bar. <laughs> Love, Hugh. P.S. Britain has now gone decimal. <laughs> as far as grandparents and parents are concerned, you never grow up. When you go back home for Christmas, it's assumed that you're not going to help with anything unless asked. Even if, in fact, you're offering. Mum, do you need a hand with no, the washing... Your mother would like a hand with the washing up. Um, would you like me to clear away the... To clear away the plates, at least. <laughs> I noticed you're a bit low... Now, we're a bit low on milk, but I don't suppose you'd have noticed. <laughs> Dad, why don't you... Now, who's going to help me shove this up my ass? <laughs> That's right, Morrissey. It's November spawned a monster, comma... <laughs> spawned, yeah, that's right. In the shape of this child. All right, well, good luck with it. Bye. I'm really grateful my neighbours still said hello to me this morning because they hear all these noises, shouts and screams coming from my flat. Like last night, they must have heard me going, No! Oh, Jesus Christ, no! You know, you turn on the gas ring and your match goes out. <laughs> I'm so bored and tired of everything. I've reached that age, 20-something, and you look around and you think, Damn! This is what the planet's like, and what? I'm just expected to carry on living for decades more. And I think, Jesus, if just neutral things are doing my head in, like looking both ways before crossing busy roads or <laughs> nodding in conversation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What am I going to do? What's going to happen the next time that something really bad happens to me? Like standing at a urinal next to some man who farts and then goes, Ah, oh, I'll bit her out than him. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't take... Another night like tonight, you know, on my own. Oh, hello. Hello, is Rachel there, please? Ah, oh, well, uh, tell your daughter uh, to phone me when she gets in. Uh, it, it's Robert, yeah. Thank you, thank, thank, thank you, thank you. Bye, bye. Yeah, I'm gonna claim the bitch, gonna make the bitch mine, yeah! I'm gonna kill the bitch, yeah! Hello, Robert. <laughs> Are you still there? <laughs> oh, dear. Welcome to a History Today. Uh, with me in the chair today is Professor F.J. Lewis, Emeritus Professor of History at All Souls College, Oxford. And we will be talking about British history between 1931 and 37, the austerity years, and principally the effect that rationing had on changes in government at that time. Professor Lewis, I wonder what you feel the nexus of cause and effect to be here. You see that Eddie the Eagle Edwards? Yes. That's you, that is. <laughs> That's your mum. <laughs> See that Peter Beardsley? I'm aware of him. That's your girlfriend, that is. <laughs> oh, ah-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. Uh, <laughs> you see that uh, old lady over there? Yes. You love her. <laughs> I don't. Psst, boy, excuse me. He fancies you. <laughs> you see... Thora Heard. I'm aware of her work. You fancy her. Oh, you are her. <laughs> I'm not. I'm bloody not. Ah, well. How could you say that? You are her. Everyone thinks you are. She's like your best friend. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Lewis. And... You're gay, you are. <laughs> Just as a postscript to what we've been saying, Professor Lewis, I'd like to say... I saw that... your mum coming out of the VD clinic. <laughs> I'd like to say that anyone with AIDS, that's you, that is, <laughs> that's your girlfriend and your mum and your dad. You know, like a pair of pants with some cack in it? <laughs> that's you, that is. <laughs> Well, I haven't come on this program to be insulted. <laughs> Good night. Things people say to the television. Number six, Dad's oh, Army. He's dead. <laughs> He's dead. He died first, didn't he, that one? <laughs> dead. Dead. 
tijd. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. That's a real tragedy, that is. Your poor wife, 20 years. Oh, I'm really upset about that. In fact, I can't take the guilt. Oh. <laughs> Although a difficult time for Ray, we continue to follow my discovery that the only things he could ever say genuinely were exactly those things that everyone else would say sarcastically. I really want to read more about Mandy Smith. <laughs> I'd like to buy both the Guns N' Roses albums, please. <laughs> oh, that's a really nice beard. <laughs> With the progress we were making, I arranged for Ray to get a job at a children's special education centre. So, um... Ray. Ray. These are kids who are emotionally disturbed. They come from mm. difficult backgrounds. And the main thing they need is just a lot of encouragement. Oh, what a brilliant drawing that is. <laughs> this must have taken you ages. You'd never guess this had been done by a remedial. <laughs> join us here for this summer's European Football Championships. Today, of course, is a very exciting day indeed because today England play their first game. And Brian, Brian, tell us, what do you think that Graham Taylor should be saying to the England team in the dressing room right now? I think he should be saying to them. <laughs> I think he should be saying to them. What were you doing in the dressing room <laughs> when the game started a full ten minutes ago? <laughs> if he doesn't tell them that, they're going to lose. <laughs> Probably uh, very sound advice there, Brian, uh, because down there, England, of course, play Herzegovina, and on the ball for Herzegovina, it's unpronounceable of itch. This man is unbeatable in the air. Fortunately, at the moment, he's down on a football pitch where he's completely useless, and <laughs> England have the ball. Platt knocks it square. That's going to make it very difficult to kick accurately. <laughs> and sure enough, Herzegovina have scored! Oh! D-I-S-A-S-T-E-R-F-O-R-E-N-G-L-A-N-D. And that could spell disaster for England. <laughs> but worse is to come in two years' time, because they've given the venue of the 1994 World Cup to the United States. And football there means American football, which I can't even understand. Basically, it seems to be like a game of rugby between two teams of motorcycle messengers. <laughs> Wait, how the Americans are going to stage a World Cup is beyond me. Hi, welcome back. I'm Dwight Spiegelhacker. Coming up later, truck racing from Iowa, World Series baseball with the Minnesota Airheads and the L.A. crack dealers. But first, <laughs> World Cup... So chair. <laughs> England versus Uruguay, and with 10 minutes to the timeout, it's one score to one. A star so far is the spearhead of the offensive line, Barry Spinnaker. <laughs> Club Nottingham Hotspur, nicknamed the Spurs. That's three drives to go with two scores. That's just one drive ahead of Webb of Manchester United, nicknamed the Shit. <laughs> Look at that. That's what this great game of soccer is all about. Just listen to those cheerleaders. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. And this is tremendously exciting. The score is still one to one with a free kick against England with just 30 seconds to go. The excitement here is unbelievable. Hi. I didn't have problem hair until I started using sponge. The all-in-one shampoo, conditioner, kettle descaler, body lotion, and spermicide with the great smell of anchovies. Sponjo, official male hygiene product supplier to the World Sotcher Cup. I tell you, Gaza is well out of it if you leave this country, well out of it. I mean, yeah, I know people say, well, if he goes to Italy, it might psychologically unsettle him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's really well balanced now, yeah. <laughs> he's well because we don't deserve him in this country because on a Saturday afternoon he'd do some brilliant piece of heel-toe magic that would set the Paxman on a roar 
and like a really witty thing as well that will make the crowd feel like an audience and then then cut to Bob Wilson in the studio saying, well, he's a good footballer, but he should try and be a bit more of an old git like me. <laughs> yeah, continued on pages 33 through 35 of some sports, some past bastard like Kevin Keegan said, well, he's a good footballer, isn't it? By the way, Kevin Keegan, you said those muggers who attacked you with baseball bats didn't know who you were. <laughs> Shinny record. <laughs> they knew who you were. Oh, sorry, Kevin, I thought you were a seal. Sorry. <laughs> they knew who you were. It's just that some people in this country have got very long memories, Kevin, and they remember the header that you missed in 1982. <laughs> when we didn't go to the World Cup finals. Trevor Brooking had just floated in the most beautiful, cultured five O levels and no bookings cross off his entire career. It beat the keeper. You just had to tap it with your head and it would have gone in, but you had to be flash and give it the old blur. <laughs> and you missed. We didn't go to World Cup. I'm just amazed the baseball bat's connected with your head, Kevin. <laughs> and now we are going. Looks like someone else is going to spoil it for us. Yeah, Graham Taylor and his experiment. Well, you've got to experiment, haven't you? That's why in goal, I'm trying Gloria Honeyford. <laughs> because we've not seen your potential there. Then at fullback, I'm using the Terminator with his delicate first touch. At three, we need a real expert reading the game. Jim Rosenthal. <laughs> then for his flair and ball skills, I'm picking Jeff Thomas. At five, Gordon Banks. Now, I know he's a goalkeeper, he's got one eye and he's 54, but he's not been tried outfield and you've got to experiment, haven't you? At six, I'm trying Phil Collins because of his obvious love of early Motown, and that's an untried quality at the international level. And number seven, M. Khan, because he's bent. <laughs> A man who's used to wearing the armband, Private Godfrey off of Dad's Army. <laughs> now, that's also because he's dead. <laughs> then at nine, because he's good in the air, Zebedee. Now, <laughs> now, that's not the one from the Old Testament, that's the one with the spring and the moustache. <laughs> now, remember, all these players are trying to book their flights to the States, so at number ten, Thomas Cook, and finally, <laughs> on the wing, the school spanner. <laughs> There comes a time in people's lives when you suddenly become aware of the interstellar coldness of the universe. Suddenly, all action seems futile as you realise you're just an ungainly collection of molecules forever dying, and that despair is, and always will be, the only truth. But for those of you who have never been stood up, <laughs> have a little know, what can I say? It's, it's like, you start thinking, oh, perhaps I said seven, perhaps I said eight, perhaps we said midnight, you know? All these people you see sleeping rough in doorways on the Strand, they're not homeless, they're just optimistic. <laughs> well, perhaps we said 1993. From then on, everything looks different, right down to the pigeons across the street. They say birds and beasts have natural peace of mind, but what? It suddenly occurred to me, if their natural given state is constant torment, the pigeons jerky fear. Mice have a 150 over 60 heart rate. That's got to feel like a lifelong panic attack, like, oh, God, I really fancy that bit of cheese, but if I eat it, I'm going to have nightmares. Oh, no, oh, God. Oh, no, here comes someone wearing a Pet Shop Boys T-shirt. Oh, God, I hope he doesn't take me up and stick me up inside his ass. <laughs> the self-conscious giraffe puts her head in the trees, and when you see a hippo in his now cold bath of scum and slime going, ah, <laughs> you know he's turned on the gas ring and his match has gone out. <laughs> Then God peoples the street up and down with couples. And not just couples, pretty women out walking with gorillas. Yeah, but the thing about Al Pacino is he is essentially limited, I think. Don't you ever get this urge? Excuse me, but I don't know if anyone's mentioned this to you both before, but you could do so much better. <laughs> God, you're right. It's a scandal. Yeah, you're right. It was only ever a matter of time. I knew I couldn't get away with it forever. <laughs> Still, four years, eh? <laughs> Oh, cheerio. I was thinking maybe this guy over here. I don't know, at least you seem to be both in the same half of the league table. So, does that mean I won't get that slight feeling of repulsion during sex anymore? Shouldn't think so. <laughs> but the thing about Al Pacino, I think, is that he is essentially limited. Yeah, why don't you just go and have sex with each other as well? <laughs> Couples have to rub it in, don't they? Excuse me, can you take a photo of the two of us together? Thanks very much. <laughs> oh, uh, before you go, uh, can you just take some pictures of me on my own? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, uh, I don't know if anyone's mentioned this to you both before, but you could do so much better. 
I was thinking <laughs> maybe this woman over here. I don't know if it's just through fear of loneliness or just being desperate for your life to fall into a, you know, let the credits roll fiction of love or what it is, but when couples first start going out, they just spend all their time pretending so hard that they get on. Yeah, yeah, I really feel the same way. And, like, I really like Primal Scream. Uh, that's amazing, cos, like, they're really atrocious. <laughs> and how did Bobby Gillespie dance before he had the stroke? I mean, <laughs> what a crap band. Yeah, it's totally brilliant. Well, we're really on the same wavelength. Yeah, I you bet, know. you know, I bet you're just like me. You actually just prefer to stay in at home, just the two of us? Yeah, what, you mean, like, a whole big group of us, about 80 or 90, hiring a load of coaches and joining up with a massive illegal rave in Ibiza? Yeah! <laughs> I mean, that, with, with, like, two twins separated at birth. I bet when you were younger, right, when you touched something with one hand, you always had to, like, touch it with the other hand. No, never! Absolutely not! I always really hated anyone that did! Well, that's brilliant! Amazing, yeah. Oh, <laughs> we're made for each other. I'm going yeah, we're like a soulmate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> People said to me, just be yourself, so I did, and now they hate me. I've had it with friends. What scum they are, you know, friends, you know? You think you're in with them, you think there's some profound way in which your twin destinies are inextricably plotted for all time, and then you make one mistake, and that's it. They don't want to know you, they don't return your calls, you know. One tiny slip-up, one slight misdemeanor, one totally unavoidable... All right, so I accidentally killed their kid. All right, they're difficult to hold, <laughs> they wriggled around, I dropped it on the floor, there was no one about, so I kicked it under the sofa, pretended it wasn't me. <laughs> Apparently, that's a sacking offence. <laughs> No, it's too difficult on your own, because then you've got to face loads of things alone. My life isn't just that, by the way, I, I should say. I mean, I don't just poo and drink milk. <laughs> and then drink some more milk, and then go and do another poo, and then think, oh, what shall I do now? I know. Glug, 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 glug. Anyway, where's that toilet roll? <laughs> watch out, watch out, there's Humphrey about... <laughs> Someone left these. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> milky, milky. Still, you come back from the long waste of the evening thinking, I'm not really that lonely. There's obviously some good explanation. She's going to call any minute. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Hi. Hello. How long will it take you to get a parcel by motorbike to Halifax? <laughs> There's the Eve, there with nothing on Face all red and her big leaves Gone Clap hands, stamp your feet Bang on a big bass drum Rum tiddly um pum 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 Stick it in your family album Well, later on, Eamon Mills will be dropping in to talk about the new travel show, Uganda the Hard Way. But right now, it's time to see what spring has brought us in the greenhouse with, as ever, our old chum, Colin Ditchmore. Hello, Colin. <laughs> Hello, Ivan. Well, as you'd seen enough be able to tell if we stepped outside, brrr, it's a bit nippy. <laughs> but whatever the conditions outside, it's always a joy to come in here where four years' effort has created a flourishing ecosystem. This week, I'm looking at tomatoes, and a mistake too many people make is using cheap cane. As you can see, this one here's got broken at the tip. Someone must have trodden on it or something. Whereas... Oh, no, is it? <laughs> oh, shit! I knew we were going to use it to grow vegetables up and everything! Ivan, do you think someone trodden it, Colin? Well, yes, perhaps. I don't know. Scumbag! Four years of it! understand what you've tried to achieve in here, Colin. <laughs> it's a flourishing ecosystem in here! Ivan, I think I can still use the garden cane, though. Can you? Yes. Look. <laughs> yes! You can still use it to grow vegetables up and everything! <laughs> There's no doubt that some things induce hideous fear. 
Halloween pumpkin lantern. <laughs> oh, gosh, they're frightening, aren't they? <laughs> oh, children are petrified of those. Ah, it's a large root vegetable with a candle in it. <laughs> oh, new underpants for me, Mum. <laughs> of course, it doesn't pay to get too blasé. I think this could do with just another couple of minutes. <laughs> Brown Fire. <laughs> yes, the British film industry collapsed largely because Hammer Films insisted that vampires were scary. But how can you be scared of anything which is in itself most terrified of garlic? Vampires <laughs> <laughs> are petrified. Ah, it's a small root vegetable without a candle in it. <laughs> And surely this must mean that vampires must be petrified of pretty much all French cooking. Like at the end of Dracula Has Returned from the Grave, Peter Cushing is killed by the hero revealing that round his neck he is wearing a casserole of chicken in white wine with wild mushrooms. <laughs> While in the classic Nosferatu Prince of Vampires, the heroine always sleeps with a large piece of pork marinated in brandy. <laughs> <laughs> Music is crucial to inducing a sense of fear. Get it wrong, and you will suffer the consequences. <laughs> but the whole of post-war culture has been overshadowed by one overriding fear. Mutually assured destruction, the fear of nuclear war. From countless films, we all knew how the world was going to end, deep down, somewhere in a concrete bunker. Yo, Steve, boy. Looks like we got ourselves a condition red. We're DEFCON 1. I repeat, this is a war situation. Oh, my God. This is not But in just two short years, all this has come to an end. The Cold War is over, the Soviet Union no longer a threat. But the Pentagon is hanging on to those bunkers. Fancy a cup of coffee? Hey, LC, boy. Looks like we've got ourselves a coffee-making situation. <laughs> we are Calcon 1. We are making coffee. Oh, my God. Check. Confirm that the milk is still fresh. Check. Milky, milky. milky. And Stephen Hugh joined Jasper on BBC One shortly for some premium quality canned carrots. Oh.